Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, and Hillel, for whom I have the greatest admiration as a true hero in confronting the United Nations, I bring you greetings from a country that will soon join you in living outside the European Union. I look forward to that future. I believe it will be a better one for the United Kingdom and for the security of Israel. I'm a great believer in referendums. I have become involved in the defense of Israel, the greatest moral cause of our generation, because Zionism is in my DNA. My father was a founder member of the World Jewish Congress, and I was raised in a home full of the books on Herzl that he wrote. And my parents and I discussed and listened in to every twist and turn in Israel's fortunes in the late 1940s and again in the 1960s. And then there came a time when I thought Zionism had completed its mission. We had a state, which was the admiration of the world, gathering in the exiles and vibrant with life and progress. And then the world perspective on Zionism changed, as you all know to the extent that it is now a hate word in some quarters. Fate has put me in the UK House of Lords, the upper chamber of our parliament, where I have a seat for life. So I do what I can for Israel and for Jewish causes. Our House of Lords is obsessed with Israel. Every year there are hundreds of questions and debates about Israel, more than there are about Syria, and far more than about, for example, Turkey or Libya. There are many hardline anti-Zionists in the Lords who are well briefed and whose comments not infrequently stray into anti-Semitism. And some of us Jewish Lords fight back. Fortunately, our British government ministers are much better disposed towards Israel than are the politicians and are far more supportive than is the European Union. Our government, for example, has prohibited Israel boycotts by public authorities. But here in Geneva, I am reminded of the terrible degradation of the United Nations and its agencies. The corruption that it results from one state, one vote in the General Assembly for states that do not give their own citizens a vote and the fixed election that led to Saudi Arabia being on the Human Rights Council. I'm delighted to tell you that the UK government has issued a warning to the United Nations Human Rights Council that the UK will vote against every motion concerning Israel and Palestine unless that body ends its bias against Israel. The UK noted the Council's failure to address the terrorism, incitement and violence that Israel faces. The fact that it is a standing item on the Council's agenda, while it is Syria that butchers and murders its people on a daily basis. This is in contrast to the European posture. We in the UK blocked the European Foreign Affairs Council from adopting a resolution that emerged from the 70 country conference in Paris recently, which the UK declined to attend. The UK has also voted against a UNESCO resolution that would have rejected Israel's sovereignty in any part of Jerusalem. And as we distance Britain further from the European Union, I believe that the British support at government level for Israel will increase. But we have a problem with severe anti-Semitism on the left of our politics. In Europe, it is the right-wing extremists that traditionally, and even now, oppose Jews. In the UK, it is the opposite, with dreadful defamatory statements being made by the Labour Party and liberal politicians. Comparison of Israel to Nazis, calling for the end of Israel, resurrecting the medieval slanders of child murder and money extortion against Jews. My explanation for this is the rising number of Muslim voters in Britain. There are more than 10 times as many Muslims in Britain as Jews. 
and they are often concentrated in certain constituencies. Politicians make anti-Israel statements in those areas in the belief, I trust misguided, that such statements will appeal to their voters. I congratulate Switzerland on the chairmanship this year of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. The Alliance definition of anti-Semitism usefully distinguishes between legitimate political criticism of Israel and illegitimate racism. Our British government has issued that definition to the authorities of all our universities, where on a weekly basis there are pitched battles between Jewish students and pro-Palestinian students, physically as well as verbally. It is an uncomfortable time to be a Jewish student in some British universities if you are open about your affiliation. I spend much of my time defending the students when they have problems and standing up for free speech in our universities, which are at risk of closing it down in the name of political correctness, except when it comes to anti-Jewish racist speech. This autumn, we will celebrate in the UK the centenary of the Balfour Declaration, when in 1917, the government minister, Lord Balfour, wrote to Lord Rothschild to express the British government's support for the establishment of a national home in Palestine for the Jewish people. The anti-Israel faction has said ridiculously that they will sue the British government for the harm done by the establishment of Israel. But I'm glad to say that our government has said that it will proudly mark the centenary in November. And we look forward to events at the highest level. There is compulsory Holocaust education in British state schools. Children go on trips to Auschwitz and to memorials. Yet this has not prevented the rise of anti-Semitism, especially amongst young university students. It is time for us to review that Holocaust education, to ensure that the students make the link between the mantra that there must never again be genocide and attitudes to Israel today. I am sure that Switzerland will also be examining the impact of Holocaust education in this year of its chairmanship of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. We know that Israel is and will always be an exceptional country. On the lighter side, let me tell you this, a story. On the sixth day of creation, God turned to the angel Gabriel and said, Today I am going to create a land called Israel. It will be a land of outstanding natural beauty. It will have green fields and oranges and a sparkling clear sea next to white sandy beaches for sunbathing. And God continues and said, I shall make the land rich in technology to allow the inhabitants to prosper. I shall call these inhabitants Jews, and they shall be known as the most talented people on earth. But, asked Gabriel, don't you think you're being a bit too generous to these Jews? Not really, replied God. Just wait and see the neighbours I'm going to give them. On Israel's 60th birthday, I was in Israel, I heard the late lamented President Perez speak. He said, who would have thought 60 years ago that there would be a black candidate for the presidency of the United States? Peace in Northern Ireland, a reunited Germany, man landing on the moon, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the internet. Looking ahead six years to the future, our children and grandchildren must be encouraged to expect similar miracles. If you will it, it is no dream, said Herzl. I believe that one day the scales will fall from the eyes of the Israel haters and they will see the truth 
in the same way that the communists and their followers eventually had to own up to the failure of that ideology and to the terrible cruelties inflicted in its name. UN Watch is doing wonders in bringing that to pass. I salute you, Hillel. I salute all those who work for UN Watch. Thank you.